there are different definitions of architecture defined by different organizations. In UML, the Unified Modeling Language, it's the collection of connected units which are organized to accomplish a specific purpose. And what you need is some kind of model which defines how these things interconnect. The IEEE says a system is a collection of components which need to be organized to perform a particular function or set of functions. And software architecture in practice says the software architecture is a program is the structure or the structures of the program which enable the elements to be connected together and the relationships between them. So what are the goals of architecture? Well, it involves various people, various parties, the stakeholders, the business goals as well, and also the IT infrastructure which needs to support it. As DevOps, the IT infrastructure is the most important aspect of it, but there are the other two to take into account. As DevOps, we'll be concerned with building the infrastructure to support the architecture that's required. So an IT architecture, what is it? Well, it's rules and guidelines and patterns of system development. So we've got to manage the problem as a series of discrete pieces. We need to define the communication interfaces between the pieces. We need to think about the overall structure and how data flows. We need to integrate the various systems and subsystems in the environment together. We need to develop software modules on the best possible design practices and design patterns. We need to control the delivery of software into the system environment effectively and efficiently and reliably. So this compares architecture and design. Architecture is more strategic, rather than design is tactical. The important word in architecture is how. How do things fit together, rather than what do we use to connect things together? We look at programming paradigms and architectural patterns, high-level patterns, rather than algorithms and low-level patterns. We're looking at the non-functional requirements. Architecture is a non-functional requirement. It's a statement of these systems are going to communicate in this way, whereas design is concerned with the functional requirements. What does the system actually do? And in UML, the diagramming language, we have certain diagrams which are more associated with architecture than those that are used for design. So let's look at some architectural patterns. The client-server architectural pattern has been around for some time. The idea is we have a thick client which communicates across a network with some external data storage. The thick client has the user interface, the business logic, and the data access layer all in the same unit of functionality. So the advantage of this is we basically separate all of the code from the, the data. It enables the server components to be reused, um, the server components are managed in some central location, and we can optimize the use of infrastructure. It's also quite scalable. So the advantage of this is we basically separate all of the code from the, the data. It enables the server components to be reused. Um, the server components are managed in some central location, and we can optimize the use of infrastructure. It's also quite scalable. The problem is it doesn't work well with the requirements changes. There are security issues as well associated with it. The server is a single point of failure, which means the whole system becomes unavailable if the one component fails. We've also got the presentation and business logic in the same place, which is not a good idea. It's also quite difficult to test and scale in terms of the thick client. Another pattern which is very popular is the n-tier architecture, where n is a number which is usually three. The great advantage of this is it's completely multi-threaded, so the, the middle layers can be executed in parallel, so multiple clients can each have their own threads executing it. If the business logic changes, we don't need to change the, the user interface client code. Typically, the client is a very thin client, such as a web browser. We reduce the network traffic dramatically because most of the network traffic is happening between the layers. And we can add additional layers or tiers for various purposes to add layers of abstraction and failover. The disadvantage, if requirements change, we need to change quite a bit, maybe in the middle tiers. The security implications are quite interesting as well because there can be problems associated with the access from the external sources. We've still got server availability and reliability issues, and we've still got testability and scalability issues. Service-oriented architectures are becoming increasingly popular. They have a great number of advantages. Probably the most important one is loose coupling. We have components which can be written in different languages, operating in different environments, 
which can communicate with each other seamlessly without having to worry about the details. We've got business services can be spread across lots of different platforms and you just use the service you need as and when you need it. We don't need to know where anything is. It can be anywhere within the corporate network or within the cloud and we don't need to know what the exact location because the infrastructure takes care of it. We can reuse services. If you've got a legacy application, what you can do is put a service-oriented front end on it and then it becomes part of a service-oriented architecture. It reduces development costs and increases development speed and it's easier to integrate the business and the IT environments. There are some disadvantages. It's quite difficult to migrate because there are so many moving parts. You need very good control. You need very good auditing and monitoring systems and probably the hardest one is getting the development and design correct. How do the pieces fit together? How do they communicate with each other? What series of operations is required to achieve a particular business goal? Many people and organizations these days are going towards REST microservices. It's a good foundation for many API designs. REST is actually not a new idea. It's been around since 1996 when the HTTP protocol was first devised. Basically, the World Wide Web is a good example of a RESTful service. So the architecture has evolved over time. The web itself has evolved massively over the 20 years it's been in existence. It focuses on resources and information and not code. What you do when you talk to a REST service is you ask for a representation of information, not for the actual data itself. So components can evolve separately. It's very highly scalable. You just add other services. Development costs is greatly reduced because each piece is a fairly small unit of functionality. And it makes data important. It exposes data as a resource and requires a separate way of representing data. The data and the code are not considered connected. The data is stored somewhere in some form. The code delivers the data in some representational form. The disadvantage is a lot of people are not familiar with the approach and infrastructures are not really geared up to deal with it, although that is getting better. It also requires a very significant change in the way that developers think about how things interoperate. Another architectural model is the 4 plus 1 view, which is quite an interesting concept. The idea is that different people and teams have different views of systems. So, for example, you've got the logical view is how the end user sees a system, which is in terms of its actual functionality. You've got the development view, which is how developers see it. What are the actual software components and how do they interact? You've got the process view, which is what are the actual processes and how do they communicate with each other? And you've got the physical view or deployment view, which is where the software actually resides on what hardware and what location. And so each of those four views gives you a slightly different picture of the system. So the four plus one architectural view says, OK, we'll take these four views and then generate the fifth view, the plus one, which are the use cases which take the solutions from the four views and combine them together into a single view in terms of use cases. Hey, want to become an expert in cloud computing? Then subscribe to Simply Learn's channel and click here to watch more such videos. To nerd up and get certified in cloud computing, click here.